TV rots your brains. Once more to today's episode of, I say it like it's a daily thing, The Web Show. Coming into our 80s basement, chock packed full of nostalgic gems from decades gone by. Yes, 80s, 90s, maybe 70s, who knows? Yeah, maybe even 2000s when we get old. Uh. <laughs> um, today's episode, our guest, fabulous actor, you will all know him. We have loved all of his films, Adventures in Babysitting, which, which we, we watched again the other night. It was a classic. I enjoyed it. I'm a bit of an Elizabeth Shue fan as well. Fox and Hound, Toy Soldiers, Life 101, recently in the Jane and Silent Bob reboot as well. Keith oh, Coogan. Keith Coogan. You only got one bag of chips. We could only afford the necessities, Kenny. This place is a crock. If you remember last episode, which was Tammy Stronach from Neverending Story, we had a competition to win a signed... Let's see it. Signed, this isn't signed, because Joe was actually signed. Imagine this signed, and that's yeah. it. So, like the documentary we just finished, Life After the Navigator, all about Flight of the Navigator and Joey Kramer, the star of the film, as we know, David Freeman, he is gonna sign a copy. I might add that it's had a few good reviews as well. It's had some really good reviews. Anyone who's seen it, go and rate it on IMDb, please. Uh, it means a lot and share it on social. Anyway, competition winner, we will, exp we will explain. We will announce at the end of the episode, so... Stay around, don't go dashing off, don't go skipping through. This is a great interview. We know you were going to hang around and watch the entire Keith episode anyway, but let's get straight into it. I feel like we've been dawdling a bit too much. Ladies and gentlemen, web show folk, Keith Coogan. So I have to say, today's web show, it is probably the most nervous I have been talking to someone for the web show. Um, on my wish list from the very, very beginning, so honoured to chat to you today, Keith Coogan. How are you? I'm brilliant, thank you. How are you, Lisa? I'm good, thank you. Um, I have a lot of questions. You've had, still have an amazing career. Um, it's spanned many years. So I guess going back to the very, very beginning, you were obviously part of Hollywood royalty with Jackie Coogan being your grandfather. Uh, I believe you had like, you were two years old when you were first on television and five with your first commercial and eight with your first film role. Correct me if I'm wrong with these facts, but I think around about those years. Doing really well. You're doing really well, yes. <laughs> Thank you. When were you aware or conscious that you were part of this Hollywood show business industry? So I was not aware at one and a half or two when I did the This Is Your Life. Previously, the whole clip had been online, but the This Is Your Life, uh, you know, estate and copyright is kind of pulled back on that. So I'd love to see the whole episode again. My mom brought me out on stage. Now, keep in mind, my mom was just 16, 17 years old at this time. She brings me out in the full kid outfit with the cap and the overalls and everything. And um, what was funny was they have a red light on the camera that's live. So there's a couple of cameras there. And when they switched cameras, I apparently saw the light switch and I went and I followed. I found my camera at like one and a half years old. So it may be in the blood. I didn't really recognize I was part of like show folk until uh, after working in the business for a couple of years. And then kind of getting it uh, after having already started and really in just commercials and some little TV roles. Then as I, I, I'm turning six and maybe seven, then it starts to dawn on me what everyone's been talking about my grandfather. Because, you know, at that age, you're into the bright colors and McDonald's and these old black and white pictures hanging around the house. And these stories they're telling, you're like, hey, everybody's grandpa tells wild stories. So it really starts dawning. And I think it, it cemented when I, at Richard Roper, we ran into Richard Roper and he said, do you remember the screening for the kid in like 1977 or 78? And I go, I don't remember that at all. He goes, he was much like the original screening where Jackie Coogan fell asleep on Charlie Chaplin's lap. You fell asleep promptly after the movie started. I passed out in the thingy um, sitting next to my grandfather while we were watching this. And then it's really dawning on me. I'm like, oh, and that was the first time I'd really 
sat down and tried to watch the kid. I'm sure I fell asleep. I still fall asleep to movies to, to this day. Um, I started to see it. And I also understood I was catching it at, at what my grandfather said. He's a has-been. He's like, you know, well, it was already uh, years after even Adam's family. And he acknowledges you get your moment in the limelight and then you step off stage. And maybe you get another show and you step on stage again. Sometimes you don't. And so that was very telling to me that, oh, this is a serious business. Yes, there's a lot of luck involved, but you could uh, maximize that luck by being prepared, uh, being present, um, enjoying it. Because I, I know a lot of talented people that just don't frankly like doing it. And I don't know why they do it, you know. Um, and so it was something that even when it's not fun, it's still more fun than anything else in life. And so it just gets hooked into you. So whether it's in the blood or from being in it early, that I, this is something you'd have to pull me away from forever and ever. It's always, you know, and, and I said, I've been union since 1976. And uh, it's not always, it's not always possible to have a talent agent or to be going up for things. And I'm so grateful that presently a great agent, you know, union uh, and uh, going up for stuff. And, and I know a lot of former child stars that they've, you know, they've given up and maybe their heart wasn't in it in the first place. It was, um, situational they found it they liked it and then they didn't like it and i always loved it even when you know it goes up and down not working in this business is more fun than working anywhere else so do you remember then maybe a particular moment where you were old enough to understand that this is actually a career that you can keep having but there will be some sacrifices with childhood do you remember a conversation where you had maybe with an agent or your parents or your grandfather where it was kind of explained to you and you made a conscious decision to keep going it was more that it was always impressed upon me that this is an elective and by my mother by jackie coogan's daughter my mother what had a very healthy perspective on the business and um kept saying this is your choice this is you can go to the beach or you can go to this audition you can do this or you can do you know whatever you want to do and of course she'd kind of planted in me that there are if you're going to do this as a career there's a path to it. It's being on top of every single call, every audition, doing great on all the jobs, following up, uh, sending gifts, letters, cards, thank you notes to casting directors. Those kinds of things are incredibly important. And then I didn't cultivate a networking skill because I kept working. As a child, I went from TV show to TV show to the end commercials and stuff. And I kept pecking away at that feature film because in my family that was the big deal i know my grandfather held the kid and his work with chaplin high above adam's family of course adam's family he did a lot of television and i'm sure he would agree that adam's family for him was you know the most seen and the most recognized and acknowledged and i think that his work with john Aston, they're pulling on old vaudeville bits i'm sure he had a blast doing it just two quick years i am the same age now at 50 that my grandfather was when he portrayed Uncle Fester on The Adam Family. He was born in 1914, and that show ran 64 to 66. Um, so I uh, heard that Tim Burton, who, by the way, also was an animator on The Fox and the Hound, is doing a new TV sh series version, and I'm sure it'll be dark and twisted and fun. And um, so I'm trying to get an online campaign to have Coogan return as Fester again. <laughs> how amazing would that be and how and how strange I guess for you to be have that connection now with him and you have that point of reference and I mean Adam's family was so iconic you know it was a were you were were you aware of how iconic those kind of shows were growing up we we were aware which ones had ratings and which ones didn't we were aware of which ones we watched and were our aesthetic and which ones weren't um, my family was pretty subversive. Uh, my mom was pretty counterculture and pretty like, what wall? I don't, let's crawl over it. I don't see a wall. And um, I'm very kind of reticent and hesitant because of that. I kind of like to stand in line and just order number two and thank you. She's ordered, my mom's already behind the counter and like open the cash register. And that kind of embarrassed me as a child. Um, so I've got some lessons to learn on being a little more aggressive as an adult. Um, the uh, So getting on shows that you loved, like, love boat or fantasy island because the bar was so high with my grandfather like i did a fantasy island junior 
And so I couldn't say I did a Fantasy Island. They would always ask for the addendum. Well, no, it was actually a Fantasy Island Junior. And that, so I got my first movie and they go, well, it's not really uh, Fox and the Hound. It's animated. So I was eight when I started doing The Voice and it was released when I was 11 because they, uh, Don Bluth had left production during halfway through doing Fox and the Hound and Disney had to hire uh, new animators and retrain them and finish the film. Remarkable how many people worked on that. People consider it's the last of the classically animated films for Disney. And in the second round of that, like, Black Diamond label VHS, those big poofy clamshell ones, Fox and the Hound was included at the very tail end of it. But still to my family, well, you haven't really done a movie yet. That was just animated. I'm a fox. My name's Todd. So I kept working at TV for, you know, five, six, seven more years. And my grandfather died in 84. And I changed my name for a year to Keith Mitchell Coogan on my headshots and, you know, the Academy Players book. Booked nothing. It was rough. Um, just going to school. I went to public school. Um, to answer the question of the other previous question is my mom always made sure I did public school, was in band, played Little League, you know, went out and played in the ocean. We lived in... Um, very inexpensive, cheap places, bordering on probably not habitable, but in Malibu. So in like 1975, my mom saw an ad for a place in the Valley, which is cheaper and hotter and, and grungier than Malibu. I know of the Valley from Clueless. That was my introduction to the yeah. Valley. The Valley from Clueless and, um, and Valley Girl. Oh, absolutely. There's a great series uh, that was on for a season called It's Like, You Know, and uh, they're going to venture into the valley on the show. And one of the characters actually wears like a pith helmet and <laughs> we're going to the valley. Um, so it was like two hundred and fifty dollars for, you know, one bedroom there. And then it was two hundred and fifty for a um, tennis change room. So it was basically a room you know, with a bathroom and no appliances or anything like that. And um, she said, well, let's live in Malibu. So I lived, I grew up in Malibu, the poor part of Malibu. Malibu is Malibu. Since the end game was to do movies, my family uh, was under the understanding that you don't want to get caught on TV. You're a mercenary, you go and you do guest episodes, but you don't get entrenched in a contract. And then, then God forbid, it becomes popular. And now you're Fonzie. And now you're Richie Cunningham and you'll never be a star again in anything outside of that original TV show. My grandfather had tasted with Uncle Fester. He, you know, after that, he always played kooks and quirks and heavies. And, and um, so we didn't want to get caught in a series. I did a couple pilots and they went short things uh, until the Waltons, which I did a year on the Waltons. It was in its eighth season. So its ratings had kind of come down a little bit. You know, America wasn't quite ready to let go of one of the remaining wholesome shows on TV. I had a great time doing it, uh, added a little sass to the show. Um, Cause I was a, uh, I was a really rotten kid on the Waltons. I'll watch them to these day. <laughs> and I sass off to everybody on the show. And um, so proud of that. We, we kept making money and doing well and um, eventually bought a house in Malibu. So, and it, I'm 10 at this point. So, um, yeah, continuing doing that and going to, you know, school and junior high and growing up just like any other kid. And then uh, I finally changed my name to Keith Coogan. And um, that's when it was really movies or bust. Did a couple of guest appearances on great shows like Silver Spoons and Growing Pains and Just the Ten of Us. Uh, a couple of other shows at that time. And then... Um, went through a process to get adventures in babysitting and you know i have to of course thank chris columbus what a fun screen debut for me since my family won't allow fox and the hound to be the debut <laughs> um although elizabeth Shue was a fantastic lead it is an ensemble project and so you know the weight's not on my shoulders i'm sharing it with so many great other people but um i often get um, so much credit, you know, and it's not just mine. It's Chris Columbus's and Linda Opes and Deborah Hill and uh, David Simpkins and the entire cast. Everybody, I watched this, I go down, I was 16. I turned 17 on the set and already had had a decade of experience in the business um, or a dozen years of experience in the business. So I was able to kind of see 
how this set compared to all the sets I'd been on. And um, it was magical. Chris Columbus, that was his directorial debut. I mean, he had written scripts, but that was his directorial debut. So was it strange to have been 16 turning 17 with 10 years experience on sets and this director, it's his kind of first time on set. Was that a strange dynamic? I know as you said, he'd written some scripts. If you want to call Goonies, Gremlins and young Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> now I know he'll even abandon Reckless. He's like, I didn't really write that, but he did. His name's on it, but he's like, I didn't really write that. It's funny, we pointed at a picture of Reckless in some production office when we were making Adventures of Babysitting. He's like, he just kind of smacked his head. He's like, I didn't, mm, I did write a script for that. He's like, that wasn't on screen. Uh, Chris was wonderful because it was so collaborative and I had no problem on a set going, you're on the wrong line of the eye line. You should be over there. Like I could tell the cameraman to move a little bit and they go, oh, you're right, shit. You know, cause they're tired. Everyone's, you know, can kind of help out a little bit. And there's that trust that kind of builds up. So if a 16 year old kid goes, hey, you should do like a Spielberg move. And you can use shortcuts cause everyone's seen the same movies. Yeah. Um, Chris Columbus gave us three movies to watch. Of course on VHS, Arsenic and Old Lace, A Day at the Races and After Hours by Scorsese with Griffin Dunn. So after hours take place all in one night, going from location to location and finally returning to the beginning. Um, Arsenic and Old Lace had that slapstick, quick kind of dialogue. And um, for kind of the zaniness, I think that's why the Marx Brothers movie was included. Uh, and so it was interesting. I kind of got Chris Columbus in those three movies. I understood him. Yeah. And... And I also knew that, you know, he'd written things like Phoebe Cates' monologue in Gremlins. So there's a darkness there in Chris. There, he's not afraid to kind of, you know, it's not all bubblegum and fluff. There is a sinisterness, you know, he acknowledges it in a fun way that kids aren't too freaked out about. They can watch it and enjoy it. The only thing about Adventures of Babysitting is the language pushes the, are in the States, PG-13. Uh, to the limit. I don't know how they got away with it. <laughs> it really does, because when you re-watch it as an adult, you're more conscious of the language and it's something that kind of surprises you and takes takes you back a little bit. Yeah, there's a few films of the 80s that were made in a time where it was okay to say things. Even if a bad guy is saying them, it, you know, you have to be really careful with that. And I don't think that there was any caution to be careful because it was so culturally accepted to uh, say a lot of these things. I don't regret it. I know that um, the writer may have a little hesitancy on a, a line or two, but um, I've also seen people embrace it. So it's, you know, it's personal kind of opinion. And that's what happens when you use dialogue that's kind of on the edge. But I think that's what kids, their parents are like, yeah, go see the babysitter movie. And the parents are off watching Interspace in another theater. And the, the kids are like, they're letting us, oh my God, all the nasty words that came out. And then they felt that it was kind of dangerous, you know. Um, it there was an adultness to it that, that maybe they didn't understand. There's a few jokes that might go over people's heads, you know, especially if you're younger. Her legs are locked together at the knees. What does that mean? I don't know what that means when I'm eight. But um, it, don't tell them on the babysitters that there's a lot more jokes that'll go over your head. So eventually, the babysitter kept it grounded enough and hinted enough adult kind of scariness with the bad guys and um, some adult themes. Did you have much chance to improvise on that film because it did feel so collaborative? Well, we did it during rehearsal. So there was a two week rehearsal period, late December of 86. That is where so many great lines just came up, just from playing. Um, we had a lot of the cast members come up. We wanted to make it semi-believable, as ridiculous as some of the, you know, we didn't want it to feel contrived anywhere. We wanted to feel grounded, like this could happen. And it's, a, you know, it's kind of absurd, it's ridiculous, but being chased, you know, by gang members and a chop shop, the mob, you know, across Chicago. So there was always a, you know, don't go too big on it, keep it grounded, keep it real. Oh my gosh, we're in trouble. And um, out of that tone, and I remember Chris Columbus saying, tone and mood are deaf. Don't play that. Play the immediate moment with the people. But um, each situation, and he wanted a few situations to stand out. The blues bar sequence, certainly. 
L train fight with the gang members, of course, the finale and hanging out the window on the building. And so we did focus on trying to make those um, really fun with dialogue. They were different in the auditions. They were different in the screen tests. Uh, scenes were moved around and chopped up just for pacing purposes. Like you might've auditioned with a scene that had three or four story points in it when you know, those will be separated when you make the movie. Rick Waite, who shot it, God rest his soul, he's gone now, but he shot a lot of great films in the 80s. Gave it that look that looks like it could have been shot yesterday. Um, it's got this nice film grain on it. You know it's shot on film. Um, it was new technology. Adventures in Babysitting and Inner Space were the first two movies to use the Panavision Platinums. I don't know what benefit comes from a platinum gate, but supposedly a finer image. This is, this is you know, full 35 millimeter with the cranes and the, you know, Shot Maker is also one of the first movies to use the Shot Maker. Um, it's a big kind of huge dually pickup truck with the crane built onto it that can get uh, follow shots. How did your family react when they could finally see you in a legitimate movie, not Fox and Hound, but... You know, they they moved you know, on to better book your next project before this one comes out, which I did, which was Hiding Out with John Cryer. So I'd finished that. Before. And also, don't forget Adventures of Babysitting. We finished filming in March, and it was released for the July 4th weekend. They put that movie together in three months from the time we finished filming to releasing it. That includes the music, a few special effects, but the special effects were shot in camera. A lot of them were done in camera with um, the IntraVision uh, technique, which is front projection. Um, but they had a few matte shots in there too. I can't believe how quickly they turned it around. And then what a finished film it looks like. It's glossy and slick. And, and like out of uh, rehearsals, I think the idea to leave Grayson hanging outside the building as a stinger at the end of the credits. Yeah. Uh, we just seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off. We're like, hey, at the credits, they kind of go, we'll do one better. We'll roll probably the longest credit sequence. It is, it's hugely long. For some reason, it crawls really slow. And they play like three classic Motown songs. And then at the very end, you got, oh, but he's hanging on the building. I love that early. Oh, and also since it's tied into Marvel through Thor, the yeah. mighty God of Thunder, that I could say that this is, I'm in the Marvel universe now. So a few reactions were on opening weekend, my family opens the Los Angeles Times and the entertainment section and the middle full fold, two page, full color ad for Adventures in Babysitting with the, you know, critics are saying and all the theaters it's playing at and this beautiful uh, blue inky sky with the city lights and the kids hanging off the building. And um, it, I went, wow, Touchstone, basically Disney. They went all in on this. They are pumping this movie hard. And it was playing in 70 millimeter in a few theaters. Was this the film that transitioned you from actor to movie actor but also teen idol that's a uh, function of uh people that are in certain phases of their career so a um an adult actor would never have that phase they would maybe go for people magazine sexiest or something you know they might go for gq layout to get that kind of cheese beefcake cheesecake kind of thing press just publicity Yes, those teen magazines tend to lend to safe, but dangerous enough to be interesting to the girls, but safe enough for the parents to let them read the magazine. So they're, they're highly fabricated personalities of all these actors and boy bands and stuff like that. And I can admit that Us Magazine and GQ are highly fabricated versions of people's exterior wish to have people kind of view them as. Um, a woman entering the business uh, in the past, it was perfectly okay for us to accept that she had to go through some sort of way to expose her body. Oh, you're in Playboy? Fine, you can have a career now. Obviously, people do not accept that anymore. Um, and so as a, as a kid actor, yeah, you got to go through that. I did hire a publicist that, that I actually paid her to keep me out of them as much as possible. Notice a lot of the pictures are taken at paparazzi-style events and then you have no control over that image. And there's where you start to hire PR and, and kind of, and that's expensive. The reason I asked that question is that I imagine it's quite a lot to take on as a human to suddenly have this different kind of attention, is it, that from what it sounds like was not really wanted in your case? 
No, I, I would say that just like an adolescent growing up, maybe might not want attention because her boobs are growing or he's getting some hair here or there, or he's starting to mature. Um, all of a sudden that unwanted attention, just because you're kind of going through a phase of your life. Um, no, uh, my grandfather even agreed there's no such thing as bad press as long as they spell your name right. So you acknowledge that it doesn't matter if the story's not true. It doesn't matter if it's if it's fake. I have a couple of shots with some girls in like Inquirer and stuff that were absolutely arranged. I didn't date them, but they said that we were dating. So that um, you know, we both knew what was going on at the time. And then in the case of like Drew Barrymore, we were dating <laughs> and then also went to some press events. <laughs> And uh, we just were like, this isn't going to work. It's hard, it's hard enough to deal with one person's public versus private thing. To have two people, I can't, I can't imagine all the permutations there. And my grandfather said, you are living privately in public. And I know a lot of the great stars, like the Brandos and De Niro's, um, De Niro used to uh, separate themselves from the public. So there's a, a, a mystery about their characters and their portrayals. Johnny Depp has had this kind of mystery, this what's his life like? You know, what does he do every night? So anyway, being in a showbiz family, you know you're not in control in the business. You're in control of your part of it. So it's not a big deal when you hit 17 and you're in these magazines because there's so many other kids going through it. I know it's a very small slice of the entire population, but there are peers handling the same crap. So you can walk up to Corey or Corey or Christian or whoever and go, hey, how's it going? I, I read the thingy. It was that, no, not true. I know, I figured as much. And you can kind of go, hey, how you doing? You okay? To that end, there is a secret, uh, an ex-child actor secret society. Some still act, some don't, some we've lost, some are still here. Um, and we talk to each other and support each other and um, just kind of get through it. There's not a lot of people that, that we can talk to that have been through, you know, and I, I also have to admit, there may be similar circumstances, but every kid actor has, just like every actor, has a completely different experience. I was beaten at eight. I was beaten at 10. I, you know, everyone, you were beaten at different times in your life. Then that's going to, I'm just kidding, that's going to affect you developmentally different. So just entering at a different year of your development, entering the business, you know. So no child actor has the exact same experience, but there's similar enough things that are different from the norm that people don't and people have a lot of questions about and go what's it like that we um it's nice to have that group well that was actually going to be one of my questions was it is this stigma of child actors moving into adulthood whether or not they're moving into adulthood on the screen or not it doesn't always seem like a very smooth transition but you seem to from a, an outsider point of view seem to have a relatively easy transition was that because you had a really rock solid family and knowledge of the entertainment industry from your family that could help with that? Ah, it's because I'm a really good actor. Um, it's because uh, that is the job. The job is that as soon as you finish working on a project, you're unemployed and you just don't know how long that's gonna last. So my thing is whether people see it or not, whether it's on YouTube or Netflix or straight to, oh my God, I had something come out straight to theaters. Pfft, that's gonna bomb. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, that it's work and you meet people and you find people that maybe that turns into something later. I have people that I met, I don't know, 10 years ago now on a whim and worked with and they're deeply entrenched in my lives as personal friends and uh, co-conspirators in this business. And I'm also kind of wising up. It took me a while as I'm 50 now, but, and I'm also very pro-union, this uh, SAG-AFTRA, is that a lot of actors have to make their own stuff and produce their own material and make a pilot and sell it. And so that kind of, that stage of really smacking in my face of like, oh yeah, I, I have to bootstrap this. Um, but still continue to read for, you know, network TV shows and films and stuff. And um, uh, yeah, I, I'm very passionate about doing it. I love it. And lucky enough just to get enough work to keep egging me on. Now you touched on, I mean, so many things you say, I have so many questions about, but you touched on Don't Your Mom, The Babysitter's Dead, which for me yeah. is the ultimate film. I adore it. I think it's brilliant. I think it's flawless. 
I think you're brilliant <laughs> in it. How did that all come about? What was that like filming? I bet everyone asked you to say the dishes line. I'm sure I won't ask you to say it, but how was that whole experience? Oh gosh, um, where do I start? So Adventures of Babysitting was Disney. Uh, Hiding Out was Della Rennes Entertainment Group, Dina Della Rennes' company. Um, then I did a New World picture. We did Under the Boardwalk, which was a surf, surfing film. Cousins for Paramount. Cheetah for Disney. So I've like bounced around a couple of studios. And then this Warner Brothers picture comes up. It's called The Real World at the time. I'm auditioning for Brian the Clown Dog Boy. I read the script and I just love Kenny. Now keep in mind, I'm 20. The character's 15. So my agent uh, at the time said, um, now that's, you're not even appropriate for it. You're going out for Brian, so fine. So I uh, had made really good friends with Chris Young, who, and this is prior to us filming Book of Love. Chris Young and I were dear friends before we both got the leads in Book of Love. And maybe that relationship had something to do with our chemistry when we read for Book of Love. So uh, I prepared with Chris, and we were already shooting music videos that were like cooking with Doug and Bob and Dave or something. And it was two stoner heavy metal guys trying to like cook toast. And so it was weird that a few weeks after we'd done a few of these sketches, I get this script and I'm like, well, this fell into my lap. I gotta go for the Kenny, I gotta do it. So we'd had, I'd had some clothes that I'd used in the music videos with Chris. We'd gone to Burbank Hair and Makeup to get long rocker wigs and they looked like crap. So we just would throw a baseball cap over them, uh, Sebastian Bach style. And I prepped that and left all that stuff in the car when I went in and read for Brian, the clown dog boy. I finished reading for that. And then I asked the casting director if I could come back and show her something. She goes, yeah, sure, Keith. And I go, cool, I'll be back in a little bit. So I go down to the car and I change into the clothes. And by this time they've changed over casting to see all of the heavy metal guys. Actually, they just read for Kenny and whoever doesn't get Kenny will then be Hellhound or Lizard or whatever. So um, I walk in and I see two of my friends right off the bat. What are you guys doing? We're reading for Kenny. The casting director is ready for me. She just, I don't even sign in. I've already signed in for the other role. So she goes, all right, well, go on, come on in. So I walk right past them and they're all really have the long hair and smell like patchouli. Love you guys. Um, and I'm considered a nerd and pretty straight in Hollywood. So it was very weird for me to go up for this role. I kick in the door with the wig. <laughs> Who's in charge here? <laughs> totally did it. I don't even remember it. I blacked out a lot on auditions and um those are the ones i usually book after i don't remember i'll call my agent i don't know what happened i blacked out and they'll go well you booked it so i kind of blacked out and at the, i do remember at the end she she says go ahead and take off your hat and your wig and i took it off and the producers they were they because they didn't recognize me from 15 minutes ago and um i i got it i got it and and then they spent three thousand dollars a piece on two hand laced wigs there's an a wig that looks really good in close-ups and then a b wig when you're cleaning the a wig and maybe it's a wider shot and as i'm getting my life cast done for these hair pieces in burbank at wigs by ziggy some legendary old school hollywood who's retiring right i see a picture of my grandfather on the wall uh, why is there a picture of jackie he goes oh uh in the 60s his pr people wanted him to have a toupee for appearances so i made your grandfather's toupees so I'm in hair and makeup an hour before Christine is even at set because I have this wig to put on. And Christine has come in, go like this, and she's on set and looks beautiful. I'd come in, then Joanna Cassidy would come in and she'd get her wig on, and then Christina would come in and basically walk onto set. 100% prepared. She's been there later than anybody else. She was shooting stuff late at night. We'd come in the next morning and Christine would show up, go right in, do it, just carry the move. She's in every single damn scene. Uh, much respect to both Christina Applegate and Elizabeth Shue. Um, I'm feeling if I do a third babysitter movie, it's gonna have to have another strong female lead. Maybe that's your, you can be like your lockdown project to write the script. I think we need it. So here we have Stephen Herrick, who is not a first time director as he had directed Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure using the same cameraman, Tim Surstep, as Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. So immediately half of Kenny is Bill and Ted. It's the, if we didn't out 
outright show him smoking weed. You could say he's just kind of this, you know, guy or he's a head rockers, stoner type. But we show them smoking bongs and talking about weed and carrying weed and, you know, dropping his weed. Can't make it up half a flight of steps without running out of breath. Thank you, Stephen, for letting me put that gag in the movie. I appreciate it. So here comes the trust here because everybody, you've got a director that's got five kids. Three of them are truly kids. And in school on set, me and Christina were already adults. You've got a set building for all of the GAW sequences where a set in the Valley um, and or Burbank. And then, um, and that was just built in a little warehouse that wasn't even like a movie where movie uh, soundstage. A lot of uh, location shooting around LA to make it, you know, really feel like LA and Santa Monica and uh, Melrose District and Hollywood. And then we got to the house and we spent two months finishing the movie at the house because a lot, so much of the movie takes place in the house. It was summer camp for adults. Everybody had a great time working on that. Everybody did their best work. All the clown dog stuff, the art department stuff, the wards, the costumes, everybody. And everybody got their stuff highlighted, I think, focus. Props and the food and all that stuff. Um, almost nothing was cut. Maybe one scene when Melissa finds the pool. We find, we discover we have a pool because it's so crappy in the backyard. We're like, we have a pool? And immediately, Danielle Harris goes, cool, and jumps in. And it comes up with like swamp moss and she's like creature in the black lagoon. They cut that sequence. Other than that, everything we shot is basically in the movie. And, you know, you asked me about adventures in babysitting about like how you felt when you did it and after. And um, I had to wait a little bit because after don't tell on the babysitter said, by the way, they changed the name of the movie while we were filming it because of MTV and re the real world, the reality show there was some, something happened and uh, they pulled 13 year old boys and they told us the new name of your movie is Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. We all died. We went, that's ridiculous. Oh my God, that's impossible. You can't, that's absurd. That's absolutely absurd. We're making this serious movie like Working Girl or Secret of My Success, you know? And they go pull this title on us. And it, it follows through on every promise that the writers made to themselves when they wrote the script. They wanted to set up the babysitter killer, but a half an hour into the movie, move on to other plots and never mention her until the last line of the movie. Hey, where's the baby? What happened to the babysitter? They're like, you can change anything else in the script. Just keep this gag. And they got it. And, um, like, and they wrote every word together. No one, the two writers, they didn't write a scene and then co-show it to them. They wrote every bit of dialogue together and I think that's why there's five great lines on every page. That movie can be quoted any moment, of, any any scene in that movie, and it's got amazing dialogue. I'm right on top of that, Rose. This is done, man. I'm right on top of that, Rose. You talk about these films, and I know we've talked about a handful of all the films you've done, but when you're on set, you have this close-knit relationship, and it seems that it's such a strong family unit. Do you still have contact with certain cast and crew from maybe one particular film or a handful of films that it was so important to you at the time that you've just kept in contact? It's funny. Ironically, uh, George Perez, we're wrapping toy soldiers. George Perez says, uh, hey, you know, it'd be cool after we get back to L.A., you know, we'll like hang out and stuff. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I've said this before in other movies to people. I said, no, we won't. Right? And he was taken aback. He goes, what do you mean? Because I'm like so involved in productions when I get there that when it's over, people are kind of surprised. And I'm like, well, we're done with the job. And, and I said, well, we're all going to move on to other things. And you're going to get a show and I'm going to get a movie and you're going to do the thing. And we're not really going to be able to hang out like you think. And ironically, he's one of the cast members I've seen the most since doing Toy Soldiers. I'm dear friends with Will. I wish I was closer with T.E. Russell, who... I wasn't even really that close on the set, but Giles and Snuffy were roommates, but they argued, I don't know, there's something, and T, I love you, buddy, and your work was amazing in the movie. You know, all five of the main kids had were at different points in their career and got something out of it or didn't or have a different feeling about it. None of these movies are trying to solve cancer. They're not trying to change the world. They're fun, popcorn, don't tell mom, the babysitter is having an adventure with Sikorsky helicopters and toy soldiers, and it's fun. They're just movies. So um, what a fun movie to do. All of a sudden, I'm introduced to the Petries, Daniel Petrie, Dan Petrie, Donald Petrie, who've directed every movie since the beginning of Mankind um, that we like. 
Dan Petrie Jr. had written Beverly Hills Cop and The Big Easy. And I mean, he's Turner and Hooch. That's one thing I was always mad at Dan Petrie Jr. I'm like, you killed Hooch. You, never. I will never forgive you. He's like, structure, man. I, got, I had to kill him. I've only seen that film once and I can't again because of that. <laughs> <laughs> so they, uh, I shot Toy Soldiers right after Don't Tell Mom and then they switched them. They put Toy Soldiers out first and then Don't Tell Mom came a little after that. And uh, so, yes, I see Will. We saw Will pretty recently. He's doing great. And although I understand that Will didn't have the same relationship with the industry that I did when we were kids, pick any age, nine or 11 or 14, and me and Will had a different relationship with the industry. And Will's such a good actor that I didn't know that. And I really wanted to kind of, I want to sit down with Will now and kind of talk about that. He said, you know, I saw Showbiz Kids on ABC. Uh, it was a documentary they did on five stories of uh, child actors in the industry. I was unaware that Will felt pushed into it and felt trapped into it and didn't, you know, I knew that he had uh, trouble with his dad. Um, and I didn't have a dad. And, and so I never could really relate to people that did have father issues because I didn't have, I had a, you know, a, kind of a single mom and some great stepfathers, but different, different deals. And that always, that's funny. I got onto a set and Michael Ironside of all people, I talked to Michael Ironside, classic character actor and a uh, great guy. Um, two minutes and he goes, tell me about your father. I'm like, God, he called me out in two seconds. I mean, that's why I'm an actor. I'm obviously paper thin veneer. You can see everything that's going on. You know, it's just fun. It's really weird to be called out by people like that. I'm like, well, I didn't have a father. I was raised by my mother. My mother, and he goes, "I didn't ask you about your mother." <laughs> like, bam, he busted me again. So, um, you know, this is part of the reason why I think that movies really work, and that I really like comedy, is because if you can identify with someone on screen and laugh at them, you can kind of give yourself a break and laugh at yourself. I do that too. Oh, that's, I would do the same exact. Oh, that's so funny. How do they get in my head? Because that's what I'm thinking. Well, the thing is, you said that, you know, movies, they're not here to cure cancer. Or, but to a lot of people, movies are that important when you grow up. It might be getting you through high school or getting you through bullying or accepting yourself. So they're, they're so important for kids watching them the other side of the screen. Well, there's also movies that can be transformative to see something like Pink Floyd's The Wall at the right age or to see Schindler's List at the right age and get it. Um, there can be movies that absolutely change your worldview overnight from having seen, if you're at the right place to see them. I've seen movies and I, ah, I didn't really, I fell asleep during it. Later I'll see it at, you know, at home or on cable or whatever and I'll go, wow, I, that you know, really profound message, something I missed. Then sometimes I just wanna watch White Chicks. <laughs> Great, well, great, real. <laughs> Genius comedy. <laughs> uh, and it's funny to see, I, you know, my grandfather saw uh, it go from vaudeville to silent films. And then he got to see it go from silent films to talkies. Then he got to see it go from black talkies to black to color. And then he got to see TV be invented. And then he got to be on TV. And then he got to see his grand, grandson kind of come up on TV. He passed before I did... Uh, on screen movies. He was alive when the Fox and the Hound happened, but once again, didn't admit it. And then I got to see it transfer from film to digital. And then I got to see the death of the movie industry. I got to see movie theaters be shut down by uh, the lockdowns, um, theater chains selling off theaters, uh, entire movie studios changing the way that they make movies and distribute them, firing marketing and distribution because they don't need them anymore. Up, oh, it's on our own channel. Just stick, stay on our channel, studio channel, and you'll get everything we'll advertise within our own channel, and it doesn't cost. So fire marketing, fire distribution, there's no distribution. Do you have an internet connection? Then you have access to everything that Hollywood will be making. That's profoundly different than 365 days ago. Back then, it was a you know, toss-up. We're like, oh, this can make 100, 200 million, 300 million. Worldwide, it made 800 million. That's gone. So to rapidly say, and then I'm seeing it democratized so that people can have a YouTube channel or a Patreon or anything, and they could have millions and millions of viewers, and then I could see studio content that has a few hundred thousand. That is a profound change. It's such a bittersweet thing, I think, because 
as an independent filmmaker, I mean, A, I love going to the cinema. I think there's nothing better. I dearly hope that cinema continues after this, but it has opened up doors to more avenues for independent filmmakers to make content and distribute content. So it's such a bittersweet time in the industry that it's kind of hard to know how to feel about it. Well, it is. I think that everyone's knee-jerk reaction is to go, well, I hope I make an indie that's big enough to be seen by the studios and bought and then district. You're thinking about it wrong. Um, put the, the movie studios are going, I hope they don't make something good enough to compete with us. And as soon as they do, buy it. Buy it overnight. Buy it at Sundance. Buy that thing. Get it under a studio banner. Because I know someone who didn't. And his name is Kevin Smith. And, you know, being in Reboot, which I have to thank Kevin again for letting me be part of the Jewish universe. I saw this man release a picture from the trunk of his car. And he took it city to city and made the gap money back in record time. Actually, most of the time, gap money isn't paid back to investors. So, you know, within a year of taking the gap money, he gave it back to investors. That's pr pretty much never been done. And then you see the DVD and Blu-ray release and, you know, it's on Amazon Prime. And um, that, uh, the work he did for it, though, which he'd set up by doing speaking tours before. Remember, music acts have said that they don't make money off of their albums anymore. And they make it off, off of touring. They make 200 grand a night or 500 or a million a night touring and selling merch, t-shirts and stuff at the concerts. And that's how they, now that's gone. Whoop. So I think Kevin Smith followed the concert model, sold t-shirts at every show, kept it to one city, one city a night, move on. One, yes, he had a broad national release. I think made a couple of mil on a night and then went city to city focused. And that was, um, that was amazing to watch, you know, true maverick putting your money where your mouth is and, and kind of pushing it in that way and believing in that distribution model and method. Um, uh, that's pretty amazing. So I think we will see more of that. Bloomhouse, you're familiar with Bloomhouse's model? They no longer do billboards. They don't do TV ads. What they do is highly targeted Facebook ads. They find people that have bought and love horror and they will enter genre. They go, actually, they like bottom, body modification horror. So we have a new body modification horror thriller. What we'll do is instead of mass marketing the country at millions of dollars, we're going to target these thousands of users that we need to buy it. And once they do, and then they go, of course, of course I'm on. They're like, God damn you, I'm in. Boom. They do it. Their core, um, your core fan base are completely taken care of. You've made your productions. Bloomhouse's model is make it cheap. Target your marketing rinse and repeat, do five a year. Um, and so they're, I think they're the ones to look to, to adapt to the new normal. And Linda Opes is one of the people that's even known for coining the phrase, there's no normal, there's no new normal. There's never been a normal. Hollywood has always been a, I don't know, that's a great story, make it, sometimes it flops. Um, so it, it is, a, it's, a, it's a, a fascinating time. It's being at the horse races and they removed the track and we're just watching all these horses run around a field. This is a this is exciting time. It's chaos, but it's exciting. And I am I am appreciative that people did run towards comfort food when the lockdown started, because I got my residual checks for uh, Adventures in Babysitting and Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead and Fox and the Hound. And I definitely saw an uptick. More people subscribed. More people were watching those shows. People buying them on Amazon Prime and whatnot. Um, and I did the same thing too. I turned to Weird Science and, and Breakfast Club and The Stuntman and Hooper and Smokey and the Bandit and Jaws and Raiders because that took me back to being eight years old or 12 years old when the world made freaking sense. It's weird being sandwiched in them because I'm a fanboy. I got to talk to Lance Hendrickson and I just blah, 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 blah. How do you talk to Lance Hendricks and not go near dark, near dark, near, oh my God, you know, and just drool over somebody. I've made a fool of myself, you know, throwing myself at people's feet and they're like, I don't deserve it, kid. A lot of the films that you were in were my childhood films um, and that goes for a lot of other people as well. But what were some of your films that you grew up with that you have that connection to? You know, you mentioned just Jaws then, um, so I know that's one of them, but were there any others that you really resonated with growing up? Most kids maybe, you know, a uh, syndicated show comes on, it's Saturday. We have like Channel 5 in LA that's like, they just play old movies. And, um, you know, 
most kids can enjoy an older movie, a musical or something, you know. I, I knew who these people were. They're my grandparents' friends. And so there was a different relationship to this stuff growing up. My mother um, was a very young mother. And so uh, she couldn't really afford daycare. So when she had a job as an usher at the movie theater, she would plop me in the front row. I was a very quiet kid to watch A Clockwork Orange and The Sting and The Exorcist, French Connection, Serpico, Dog Day Afternoon. So movies, uh, well-made movies, uh, Kubrick films and Coppola films, and especially the 70s Mavericks, the ones that kind of bucked the studio system, the Chiminos, the De Palmas, the Scorseses, Spielbergs, Lucases, John Milius, John Milius, I'm gonna throw some Milius in there. Roger Corman, um, th those, I love that. That's why I'm so glad you, Sam. Sam is, we love Sam, Sam Jones. Now we've been doing autograph conventions. Sam is a staple and Sam has it all figured out. Huge backdrop, Flash Gordon stuff, great artwork. Talks to everybody, gives you really good Sam time, right? And will uh, sell you the shirt off your back. He's amazing. He also shows up early, stays late, never misses a you know commitment. Um, he just showed us a work ethic to appreciate the fans back that I'd never seen before. I, and Ted, and you know, Ted too and stuff, that, that kind of acknowledgement, that's what I think happened with um, Jay and Silent Bob Reboot. A filmmaker said, I want to acknowledge this older work, you know. And I, I mean, that's just, that's just really amazing. He, that's what Kevin said. He goes, you know, before I started making movies, I watched a lot of movies. So anyone who was kind of in it, doing it before he'd started, um, you know, I totally get it. So, so growing up and also having neighbors that are Oscar nominated, like Gary Busey was one of my neighbors growing up and I was really good friends with his son, Jake. And it's just, yeah, my grandfather was the world's first child star. His dad just got an Oscar nomination a year or two ago. And, and it's like, where you want to go down to the Creek and play, you know? So it normalizes itself. That kind of like, oh, it was only an animated movie. People in show business, we bust our own chops. We'll, we'll be, hey, how long has it been since you've done a studio picture? And we'll bust our own chops. Um, my grandfather had a saying, it's better to be a has-been than it never was. And it's bitter and mean. And if someone goes, oh, when was the last time you did a movie? My grandfather would say, when was the last time you did a movie? Yeah. Very defensive. And I'm like, I'm just grateful to have done any of them. And I like how you said you've been in or you still are. You corrected yourself. And I thank you for that. And I'm also not one to mind if someone goes, you had a great career. I did. I'm still, still at it. And hopefully we'll do a movie. And if I don't, it's okay. Because I know on my tombstone will be Keith Coogan, the dishes are done, man. <laughs> and, but, but I have maybe some more years. I'm just 50. Maybe I can come up with another quote something you never know if it doesn't happen at least i got that so i'm very very fine with that <laughs> so obviously 2020 has been a year where everything's kind of gone out the window but do you have any plans next year that people can come and meet you um uk us state wise that people can come and say hi in person every single show has been postponed delayed we have several and they've been pushed postponed delayed so um i know it's not up to them we did just book a few more and sign some contracts. The day after signing a contract, something got moved. So I don't, I can't say what dates are set or not, but I do know that they're trying to line up. Thank you so much for chatting. It has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, fingers crossed 2021 picks up and I can meet you in person at a Comic-Con. Adam, Gradwell, Steve, Scene Steelers, get on it. Um, really appreciate you taking the time and it has just been an absolute joy and very surreal to talk to you. So thank you. Lisa, you're awesome, and you, you, you stood up to your bargain. You, you said there'd be questions that are a little bit different, and they were great. You had great research, very in-depth. I appreciate that, and uh, thank you. It was a great interview. Competition time. This bad boy. Imagine it signed. Again, imagine it signed. So we asked you in the last episode, which was Tammy Stronach. I'll put a card. The lovely Tammy Stronach, we might add. I, very lovely. Um, Make sure you go and watch it if you haven't watched it. But uh, I asked you to say what your favorite scene in Flight of the Navigator was. Mm. Um, and we have a winner. What, the, who is the winner? The winner is... Drum roll, please. Mike Shirley. 
Mike Shirley, this is coming your way. So Mike, I'm going to read out the full answer from, I took a photo of it because I don't have my computer here. So Mike says, my favorite scene in Fly the Navigator has to be the scene where David first encounters the spaceship. I was mesmerized as a child how they did the effect where David walks up the steps, weren't we all? We know how it was done now as well. Of course it was animated. Well, if you don't know how it was done, watch the film. Yeah. Uh, of course it was animated when the steps first formed, but it was so clever back then with a the real perspective camera trickery, how David began to walk up the steps and was real. Very good. One of my favourite scenes as well, to be honest. I think everybody loved that, him walking up the steps and then bouncing like a bit as a portion, kid. you're like, what? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Watch the film. You'll e learn how they did it. Email info at lifeaftermovies.com to send me your address and I will, when the signed copy arrives, get it to you. It'll be hurtling towards you, like oh, like no. Star Wars, the thing coming out towards um, you. Thank you all so much for watching. Thank you again for Keith Coogan. All of his social media links are down below, as are ours. So please follow everyone. Let's just end 2020 on a social media storm. storm. <laughs> Until next episode, you stay classy. <laughs>